Hey fam, Raif Darazi here, and this is your roundup of the latest HIV news for the week of... Well, this is actually an old script that I never got around to filming, so... The, these are some articles from the last couple months. Enjoy. Today I'll be going through 14 articles covering topics ranging from a new potential HIV cure hopeful, the next wave of antibody therapies, the added potential benefit of Ozempic for people living with HIV, a new implantable device for HIV treatment, and more. I won't be reading these articles per se, but I will give you a brief summary and sometimes throw in my opinion and commentary. A big shout out and thank you to Dennis Nelson for $50 uh, super thanks on the last HIV news video. Tan Anderson for two super thanks of $15 each on my most recent video post and most recent YouTube shorts post. I appreciate the support so, so much. Number one, Filter Magazine. HIV rights advance for cops ahead of the sex workers they criminalize. The city of Nashville settled a federal discrimination lawsuit over its policy of barring people with HIV from serving as police officers. The lawsuit was filed by a former Memphis police officer referred to as John Doe, who had his job offer rescinded after disclosing his HIV status, despite medical evidence showing that his suppressed viral load posed no risk to the public. The Metropolitan Nashville Police Department paid a $145,000 settlement and updated its civil service policies to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. This decision comes amid ongoing federal lawsuits against Tennessee, for discriminating against people living with HIV, particularly regarding the state's, quote, aggravated prostitution, end quote, statute, which imposes harsher penalties on sex workers living with HIV. These laws disproportionately affect marginalized communities and perpetuate stigma surrounding HIV. Number two, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, new HIV case rate in Metro Atlanta, third highest in the nation. In 2021, the Atlanta metro area ranked third in new HIV diagnoses among U.S. metro areas, with a rate twice that of other metros and two and a half times the national rate, according to Jeff Cheek of the Fulton County Department of HIV Elimination. Atlanta accounted for over half of Georgia's 2,371 new HIV cases that year. Although nationally new HIV cases have decreased, the South, including Atlanta, saw spikes. Despite advancements like wider testing and PrEP availability, Black and Hispanic males continue to have higher infection rates. Resources in Atlanta include improved websites for finding care, funding for regional agencies aiding those impacted by HIV, and expanded prevention programs such as providing clean needles for substance abusers. However, challenges persist, including stigma, disparities in care access, and limited funding for preventive measures like PrEP. Number three, FizzOrg. New method uses nanofibrils on magnetic microparticles to isolate HIV particles. Researchers at Leipzig University and Ulm University have devised a novel method using peptide nanofibrils on magnetic microparticles to isolate HIV more effectively from samples. These PNFs, peptide nanofibrils, based on the EFC peptide, form tiny fibrils capable of binding to viral particles. By employing this technique, the researchers aim to enhance the sensitivity of existing diagnostic tools for detecting HIV infection. Their study demonstrates the efficacy of PNFs in separating HIV particles from solutions without the need for centrifugation. This innovative approach could revolutionize HIV research and diagnostics, offering potential benefits for monitoring resistance and improving infection diagnosis. Number four, Medical Express. Implantable device delivers HIV antiviral with more potency than oral drugs. The Houston Methodist Research Institute team has developed a nanofluidic implant that delivers HIV medication more effectively than other methods. Their study, published in the Journal of Controlled Release, suggests this implant could offer a long-lasting solution for managing HIV. Led by Dr. Alessandro Grattani, the research focused on the drug Islatravir, showing its potency when administered continuously through the implant. Compared to other HIV drugs, the implant delivered Islatravir with five times greater potency. This advancement could address challenges like treatment non-adherence and side effects. The team is also exploring the implant's potential for HIV prevention. With further research, this technology could provide a safe and efficient option for HIV patients in the coming years. Number five, science.org. Long-lasting injectable HIV prevention drug set for, quote, aggressive, unquote, rollout in Africa. 
the introduction of long-lasting injectable PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention may soon revolutionize prevention efforts, particularly in Africa, where HIV rates are high, but access to prevention tools has historically been slow. While the injectable version of PrEP containing cabotegravir has faced hurdles in uptake in wealthier countries due to cost and insurance issues, it's being championed by programs like PEPFAR for distribution in African nations at discounted rates. Studies have shown its effectiveness, and its potential impact on reducing new HIV infections is significant. However, challenges remain in making it widely accessible, including lowering costs and addressing concerns about cost effectiveness. Nonetheless, the availability of injectable PrEP alongside existing options like pills and vaginal rings offers hope for expanding HIV prevention strategies and reducing infection rates in the future. Number six, Medical Express. Perinatal transmission of HIV can lead to cognitive deficits. A comprehensive analysis by Georgetown University Medical Center neuroscientists revealed that perinatal transmission of HIV from mother to child during pregnancy, labor, or breastfeeding is linked to significant cognitive deficits as children grow older. The study, which examined data from over 35 studies, highlights the ongoing challenges faced in combating perinatal HIV infection, particularly in low- and middle-income countries where access to care in antiretroviral drugs is limited. Children with perinatal HIV transmission and adolescents showed impairments in processing speed, working memory, and executive function compared to those not living with HIV. Notably, the severity of processing speed deficits correlated with the country's gross national income per capita, the researchers emphasize the need for improved education and support programs to enhance the long-term cognitive outcomes of children living with HIV, calling for collaborative efforts to conduct larger studies in diverse geographic regions. It's important to note that this is an observable correlation of cognitive deficits in those with HIV versus those without. It's not necessarily causal. And an important note in the study is that it appears to be greater, at least when it comes to processing speed in those coming from um, countries with a lower gross national income per capita. That kind of hints at the fact that maybe there's more socioeconomic factors at play rather than just HIV itself. Again, more study is needed. Number seven, The Lancet. Anal self-exam is a valuable screening tool for anal cancer in sexual and gender minority persons. Dr. Nitre, sorry if I mispronounced, and colleagues address the disparities in cancer prevention and treatment among sexual and gender minorities, focusing on men who have sex with men and transgender women. Anal cancer, primarily caused by HPV, is rising in the U.S., particularly affecting these groups. The study highlights barriers to healthcare access and the discomfort that sexual and gender minorities individuals may face during medical encounters, leading to a reluctance for routine screenings. Self-conducted testing and screening emerge as a feasible and acceptable solution, offering a way to mitigate distress and overcome healthcare barriers. The International Anal Neoplasia Society guidelines recommend digital anal rectal examinations for screening, especially in areas lacking high-resolution anoscopy infrastructure. While digital anal rectal examinations, or DARE, remains crucial, self- or partner anal exams present a promising tool for early anal cancer detection among sexual and gender minority populations. Moving forward, education, community engagement, and further research into self-exams or other sexual gender minority groups are essential for widespread adoption and improved healthcare outcomes. You know, I definitely can relate to this. Um, my current doctor at Kaiser is not an HIV specialist, and uh, the last appointment was supposed to be a physical, and so I was fully ready for a physical. I was actually looking forward to it because I wanted to address some um, just general concerns that I have and getting older and making sure to, to check my prostate and things like that. Anyway, I was at the appointment and I mentioned that it was a physical and he goes, oh, no, 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 it's just a physical checkup. So I'm just going to ask you some questions. And I was like, oh, he was super dismissive and he never prompted or asked if that was something I was interested in or would like to do. And I got the feeling that he was not wanting to do it anyway. So I just kind of let it go at that. I was like, I don't want someone probing around inside me if they don't want to. So <laughs> um, I, I just have had multiple bad experiences with this doctor. So I'm looking to find somebody else. And frankly, 
having a doctor that understands like, okay, I'm a gay man who has HIV, someone who is comfortable and, and really intimately understands my needs is so important. And I see that based on this interaction alone. And I'm sure other people have similar experiences as well. So with that said, this idea of self-examinations is like, hello, yeah, I want to hear more about that. What do I do? How do I do it? <laughs> Teach me. So anyway, I'm going to keep my kind of finger on that one, no pun intended, and see if I can get more information about like self-exams and the types of things that we should be concerned about as we get older. Number eight, stat news. Creating the next wave of antibody therapies requires innovative collaboration. The potential of next generation broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs to combat global health threats like HIV, malaria, and Ebola is immense, with the possibility to save millions of lives annually. However, realizing this potential requires overcoming significant challenges, particularly regarding manufacturing costs and accessibility, especially in low-income countries where these therapies are most needed. The high production costs of BNABs pose a barrier to affordability in regions with economic constraints. Dr. Udebe R. Essien emphasizes the importance of pharmacoequity, advocating for accessible medical therapies for all, regardless of race or income. A proposed business model involves a consortium of pharmaceutical companies and philanthropic organizations establishing manufacturing capabilities in middle-income markets, aiming to diversify products and reduce financial risks. Immediate steps include securing funding and fostering community engagement to ensure sustainable adoption of BNAB innovations. Ultimately, aligning economic incentives with global health goals is essential for ensuring equitable access to groundbreaking therapies worldwide. Number 9, L. Three women contracted HIV from vampire facials. Here's what you need to know. Okay, so I've seen this article, different websites, multiple times over the past however many months, and I was like, I don't really want to dig into it, but now I'm seeing it on L magazine, and that's super mainstream, um, so I just really want to cover it and make sure that um, I go over it. The CDC's latest health investigation revolves around platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, microneedling, popularized as, quote, vampire facials, unquote, by celebrities like Kim and Kourtney Kardashian. At VIP Spa in New Mexico, three patients contracted HIV due to staff negligence and unsanitary facilities. This alarming case underscores the importance of thorough research into facilities and practitioners before undergoing any cosmetic procedure. While the treatment is relatively safe when done properly, risks like infection, scarring, and hyperpigmentation exist. Those have nothing to do with HIV. Experts advise patients to choose licensed practitioners, ensure sterile equipment, and opt for medical settings for procedures to minimize risks. Although rare, this case serves as a reminder to prioritize safety in cosmetic treatments. Yeah, you know, it kind of like mm, bugged me a little bit just the amount of attention that this was getting. Like, I saw it everywhere for months. This The same articles popping up. Oh my gosh, HIV, HIV. Um, but it's like, Again, the main takeaway from this article is you need sanitary working conditions, especially if you're going to do anything, any kind of procedure on your body and potentially expose yourself to pathogens. That is the takeaway, not the fact that this, you know, there's this like outbreak of HIV all of a sudden, because that's kind of irrelevant. It could have been any disease or any kind of infection, and it had to do with their unsanitary practices at this clinic. That's what the story should be about. Number 10, gay times. Prep slut shaming is still alive and well and it's harming us all. This is an opinion piece. Prep or pre-exposure prophylaxis is hailed as a groundbreaking tool in the fight against HIV with the potential to prevent transmission by up to 99%. However, alongside its remarkable scientific achievement, prep has unfortunately sparked a new form of slut shaming known as prep shaming. People taking prep are often labeled as promiscuous and face discrimination for using the medication. Research shows that a significant percentage of PrEP users in the UK and the US have experienced ridicule and discrimination. This stigma not only undermines the scientific progress of PrEP, but also jeopardizes its availability and accessibility. It's crucial to combat PrEP shaming and recognize PrEP users as responsible individuals who contribute to HIV prevention efforts. Now, I was kind of surprised to see this article because I've heard of PrEP shaming, I heard about it, I don't know, I want to say like five to ten years ago. I didn't realize it was still a thing, but this is the first time I've heard of prep shaming in 
quite a long time. What, what do you guys think? Is that something you've encountered recently? Is that something you've encountered at all? I'm curious to know if this is legitimately something that is um, a problem in a lot of areas, because if it is, then I'd like to put more attention on it. Number 11, the Jerusalem Post. Ozempic helps HIV patients, not just diabetics and celebrities, losing weight. Semaglutide, commonly known as Ozempic, has been making waves for its effectiveness in weight loss, particularly among celebrities. Originally marketed for type 2 diabetes and obesity, a recent study has found another potential use, treating fatty liver in people with HIV. The research conducted by experts from the University of Colorado discovered that Ozempic could effectively reduce liver fat in individuals with HIV addressing a common complication called metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, Woo! MASLD. After 24 weeks of treatment, significant improvements were observed, suggesting Ozempic as a promising therapy for fatty liver in this population. This finding not only benefits liver health, but may also lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, which is elevated among people living with HIV. If this is something you're dealing with with your liver, be sure to talk to a healthcare professional, see if this is an option for you. Number 12, PolitiFact. HIV doesn't spread through pools, but some online users wrongly claim people are getting infected. A recent Facebook post claimed that four people were infected with HIV after swimming in a pool in Texas due to poor maintenance and lack of chemicals. However, this claim is entirely false. Medical experts, including those at the University of Rochester Medical Center and Stanford Medicine, confirm that HIV cannot spread through swimming pools or hot tubs. HIV is primarily transmitted through sexual contact, contact with infected blood, sharing needles, or from mothers living with HIV to their babies. The city of Arlington, Texas has not received any reports of such incidents. Therefore, the claim made in the Facebook post is entirely untrue. The post, as I saw, previously was on one of those neighborhood apps, forums, one of those little neighborhood chat things, and someone had posted a message in there and someone screenshotted it. I don't know if it was the same person and they posted on social media with the screenshot um, saying something to the effect of, guess I won't be going to the pool this summer. This is oddly familiar for those who don't know at the 1988 Olympic Games famous diver Greg Louganis hit his head on the diving board and some of the blood went into the pool. Greg Louganis had HIV at the time and hadn't disclosed it until afterwards and there was controversy about the risk that he had put the other divers in um, because of the exposure of blood and in the pool and exposure to the doctor that had treated him at the time. Yeah, so HIV isn't too fond of being outside of the body, for one, and second, it's not too keen on chlorine either, so... That's a big nothing burger. Number 13, the London Free Press. Stem cells might cure HIV. Researchers at Western University, in collaboration with scientists from the UK and US, are preparing for clinical trials of an injection developed in London that could potentially eradicate HIV in patients, offering hope to millions worldwide. This injection, set for human trials later this year, targets the residual HIV, or latent reservoir, hiding in the body aiming to allow patients on HIV treatment drugs to permanently cease medication. Professor Eric Arts, leading the research, explains that the injection specifically targets cells harboring remnant HIV, offering a more precise approach compared to previous broad treatments. The injection, resembling HIV particles, stimulates an immune response to attack residual virus, with initial trials focusing on safety and later phases assessing effectiveness. Although results are years away, the injection manufactured in London holds promise for revolutionizing HIV treatment. The study's lead author, Ryan Ho, emphasizes the meaningful impact of the research, highlighting its potential to transform the HIV AIDS landscape. Number 14, Mind Matters. London-made HIV injection has potential to cure millions worldwide. Paul Edmonds, a 68-year-old from California, is potentially on the brink of being declared cured of both HIV and blood cancer. After receiving a transplant of adult stem cells, he has shown no signs of either condition for five years. Doctors are optimistic about his progress, stating that he is officially cured of cancer and may be declared cured of HIV in two years if he continues without medication. 
The stem cells, donated by a person with a genetic mutation resistant to HIV, were used to treat his cancer, leading to promising results. Researchers are now exploring ways to create stem cells with this beneficial genetic mutation to combat HIV further. This success story highlights the potential of adult stem cell therapy in medical treatments, contrasting with the previous emphasis on embryonic stem cells, which have yet to yield approved therapies despite initial hype. I've actually had the opportunity to interview Paul Edmonds on my channel, and if you haven't seen it yet, I'll post a card here so you can watch that now. Links to all these articles can be found in the description box below this video if you would like to join my new mailing list. I'm just starting it. There's a link in the description box below. Once I get a good number of folks on the email list, I will start putting together quarterly email blasts with updates on me, teasers of what's to come, some news highlights, perhaps share some thoughts on the state of things and some fun surprises even. As usual, it's totally free and you get to stay better connected with me and what's going on. Be sure to like this video, subscribe, and hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this with anyone who might find value in this content. Until next time, cheers.